No matter what you're looking for, you can probably find it in the Bible. Many people are familiar with the more popular Bible animals like Jonah's whale and the menagerie on Noah's Ark, but there are lots of other weird creatures in the Bible that you might not have covered in Sunday school. It's sort of common knowledge at this point that those white lady with wings angels that we all grew up with don't appear anywhere in the Bible. Angels are more of a culturally accepted shorthand than a straightforward adaptation of the source material. So why did artists across the centuries decide to depict the heavenly host as white-garbed, blonde-haired bird women and not the way they were described in the text? Probably because if you saw pictures of what angels were supposed to look like, they'd haunt your nightmares. In Jewish tradition, there are ten orders of angels, and the Ophanim are considered some of the most holy. There's a lot to go into, and parts of the description come off a little like a fever dream, but essentially, Ophanim are flaming gyroscopes covered in eyes, guarding God's seat of power. That's a little harder to paint on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. The behemoth is one of a handful of creatures in the Bible that historians have been arguing about for quite a while. Scholars can't agree on much about this puppy, but they know two things. He was big, and he had a belly button. The Book of Job describes Behemoth as a giant reed-dwelling creature that's too powerful for anyone except God to control. Depending on the interpretation, it could drink an entire river, and its strength was significant enough to be worth mentioning four times in a single paragraph. But besides big and strong, the closest thing we get to a descriptor is a line about how, quote, his force is in the navel of his belly. So aside from the super-powered belly button thing, what could the Behemoth have been? Most modern literal interpretations point to either a hippo or an elephant, but there's also some debate as to whether it was just a metaphor for the power of God. The second creature described in the behemoth passage of Job is the Leviathan, and where the behemoth leaves quite a bit of wiggle room for visual interpretation, the Leviathan is bizarrely well fleshed out to the point of making the behemoth seem like an unloved afterthought. No, really. Job goes into staggering detail describing all of the wildly upsetting aspects of this creature's body. Whereas the behemoth is considered the beast of the land, the leviathan calls the water its domain. It has double-thick armor plating running down its back and muscular folds all over its body. It breathes fire. Its skin is impenetrable, tough as stone. It honestly reads more like a description of Godzilla than a Sunday school story. As with the behemoth, the leviathan has been the subject of plenty of debate over the years. Unlike the behemoth, however, the language used to describe it doesn't leave a lot of room for poetic license. While people have theorized that it may have been a crocodile or a particularly weird whale, it's a little difficult to square that with fire-breathing rock monster. The descriptively named First Beast is laid out for the reader in Revelation 13.1. Also called the Beast of the Sea on account of its oceanic point of origin, it sports ten horns with crowns on top of them, the name of blasphemy written across all seven of its heads, the feet of a bear, and the mouth of a lion. It's also described as taking a lethal beating to one of its heads before miraculously healing itself. The first beast shows up again a few pages later in Revelation 17, when an angel pops its head in to explain that the creature was a metaphor for mountains, and also a metaphor for kings, and also, well, Revelation has never been the easiest nut to crack, you know? Revelation's second beast is a mysterious son of a gun. Introduced at roughly the same time as beast number one, this shady fella emerges from the earth in what you have to assume is a pretty dramatic spectacle. It has the voice of a dragon and the horns of… a lamb? Huh. The second beast acts as sort of a hype man for the first beast. In Revelation 13, it's seen convincing human beings to worship the first beast, pulling stunts like making the sky rain fire. It also has the dubious honor of branding the hands or foreheads of its followers with the mark of the beast, an enigmatic physical sign indicating fealty to the forces of darkness. There's no mention of whether or not this is its way of compensating for its only remarkable feature being a pair of lamb horns, which rank pretty low in terms of intimidation factor on the list of possible horns to have. <laughs> The King James Bible includes a staggering 34 different mentions of dragons, which is pretty undoubtedly a matter of creative translation. Some are just illusions lending themselves to colorful hyperbole, like when Deuteronomy says that wine is the poison of dragons. But Isaiah comes riding in with some literal monsters to slay. According to chapter 13 of Isaiah, after Babylon falls, its palaces will be infested by dragons, as well as satyrs and, oddly enough, 
owls. What's going on here? We're owl exterminators. Oh, then you won't have any problem exterminating this owl. <laughs> Dragons appear again in chapter 34, where they take up residence in another city that's Hulk smashed by the wrath of the Almighty. Things get even more intense in Revelation, as they tend to do. There, we see that Satan takes the form of a great red dragon, fighting angels in a heavenly battle royale. In a stunning upset, one particular angel lays on a smackdown and banishes the creature to the bottomless pit for a thousand years. It's worth noting that of the many uses of dragon in the King James Bible, 17 are derived from a Hebrew word which is alternately translated as whale in Genesis 1.21 and sea monsters in Lamentations 4.3, making it kind of a catch-all for a big scary animal. Rounding out the list of Bible animals that seem more at home in a D&D campaign than in scripture is the cockatrice. It shows up three times in the King James translation of the book of Isaiah, generally in foreboding passages and descriptions of the works of evil men, all of which leads to one important question. What is a cockatrice? For the benefit of the more outdoorsy kids in the crowd, a cockatrice was a mythological creature that was a lot more popular in the Middle Ages than it is these days. It was a sort of low-key dragon, a winged, two-legged serpent with a rooster's head. As fun as it is to imagine weird chicken snakes on Noah's Ark, all signs point to the inclusion of the cockatrice being a strangeness particular to medieval translations. While the King James Bible brings it up, other versions have a killjoy habit of interpreting the Hebrew root word as adder or viper. In a twist that will come as a shock to nobody at this point, yes, there are unicorns mentioned in the Bible. It just sort of depends on which Bible you read. See, the Bible is funny. A lot of it has been interpreted and reinterpreted hundreds of times in just about every language. Different societal situations at different points in time have yielded wildly diverse understandings of what the original text meant, with some words having more than one meaning and others having no direct translation at all. Sometimes blanks needed to be filled in. And that's one explanation for why the King James Bible, first printed in the early 17th century, mentions unicorns not once, but a whopping nine separate times. They're generally used as a point of reference or a metaphor, but all that changes in the book of Isaiah. In chapter 34, God is on a hot streak, cutting down sinners with a sword filled with blood and ram kidneys. It's foretold that while this happens, unicorns and bulls will overrun the land and lay the place to waste. Everybody knows a cherub when they see one. They're the pudgy, lovable cupids sprinkled around staff rooms in confetti form around mid-February every year, shooting love arrows into the hearts of even the most stalwart bachelors. Unless, that is, you read the source material, in which case they skew a little more toward terrifying chimera than pinchable angel toddlers. As described in Ezekiel, the cherubim are an angelic order with a lot going on physically. They have four faces, for starters, including an eagle, a lion, an ox, and a human. Each one of them had four wings, too, as well as straight legs capped at the end with shiny bronze bull hooves. They're traditionally given a series of heavenly duties, maybe most famously guarding the gates of Eden. In some traditional teachings, they're considered the ninth highest order of angels and associated with the task of helping people move beyond their sins in order to be closer to God, and for fans of raiding lost things, they're also what's described as being sculpted onto the lid of the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus. As with lots of biblical creatures, the cherubim have shifted visually over time. As popular art changed, they became thematically intermingled with the Greek-Roman god of love Cupid, or Eros, and are now visually synonymous with the lovable winged babies we're all familiar with. In Genesis, shortly after Adam and Eve were 86 from the Garden of Eden, people started getting on with the business of making more people. While a lot of that went down about the way you'd expect, there were some glaring irregularities as well. It was a hectic point in the biblical timeline, and a lot of strangeness gets ever so slightly swept under the rug, at least in terms of the things they teach in Sunday school. Exhibit A, the Nephilim. In Genesis chapter 6, it's relayed that the sons of God, usually interpreted as fallen angels, noticed that the human ladies were looking pretty all right. The angels got hitched to human brides, and the resulting progeny were the Nephilim, a race of violent giants. How giant is giant? In numbers, they're described as being roughly to people what people are to grasshoppers. So, you know, big. 
The Book of Enoch, an apocryphal religious text that didn't make the final cut of the Bible, said they were nearly a mile high. They're also considered to have been symbolic of the corruption God felt he needed to wipe out with the Great Flood. Wait a minute, talking animals? No. Yes! There are two prominent talking animals in the canonical Bible. The first is a gimme. In Genesis, Eve is tempted by a snake with more interest in her nutritional intake than you tend to see in a standard reptile. The second one is a little more obscure, but just as strange. In Numbers, we meet Balaam, a troubled prophet. Long story short, Balaam is on a road trip, but God doesn't feel great about it, so he sends an angel to mess with the donkey Balaam is riding. The angel, invisible to Balaam, freaks the donkey out, making it veer off course and smack Balaam against a wall. Balaam gets angry at the donkey and smacks it around. That happens a few times, and then God gives the donkey the power of speech. Are you talking to... Me? After he and donkey chat for a while, the angel shows himself to Balaam and says that if the donkey hadn't been dodging him, the angel would have killed Balaam by now. Balaam repents and goes about his business and apparently never checks back in on the whole I own a talking barnyard animal development. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.